uh, on the 27th of September started the war. Um, what is your answer to the question, who shot first? The answer is Armenia, and we have evidences, because the first victims among civilians and military personnel were Azerbaijanis. That was the third in a row military provocation against us. The first was in July, when they launched an attack on the state border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we had casualties among civilians and military personnel. The second uh, attempt was August, when Armenia sent a sabotage group whose leader was detained, and he gave evidence that he was sent in order to attack civilians. And the third time, on the 27th of September, they launched a heavy artillery bombardment on some of the villages and cities situated close to the line of contact. We responded, and so that's how it started. You responded tough and harsh? Yes. Um, why like this this time? Is it the predominance of the Azerbaijan military because of the drones from Israel and Turkey? We had these drones from Israel already for many years. And by the way, some of them were used uh, in 2016 during the, again, uh, Armenian provocation, which launched in the liberation of the part of the occupied territories. But that clash lasted for several days because Armenia stopped. And if they stopped this time, we would have stopped also, but they didn't. They wanted to uh, make a big damage. They started to shell cities which situate far beyond the line of contact. And we had many uh, victims among civilians, so far 69. So we had to defend ourselves, defend our people, and to respond. So our response was harsh, but they deserve it. As far as I understand, you gained some ground in the south especially, but as well, I mean, uh, next to Bergkarabakh, uh, further in the north. Um, how long will this war continue? It depends on Armenia. I said many times, uh, we are ready to stop today. And by the way, uh, the fact that three times we agreed for ceasefire demonstrates our will to stop military confrontation and to resolve this issue uh, on the negotiation table. Uh, by political, you know, uh, purposes, political means. But three times Armenia brutally violated the ceasefire. But they claim the same. But look, yes, yeah, definitely they do, but look at uh, what happened. Uh, on the 10th of October, the humanitarian ceasefire was announced. The next day, they launched a ballistic missile attack on Ganja from the territory of Armenia. And probably you've seen the devastation which is caused, and 10 people were killed civilians. They say it's not them, but it is clear because the launch of ballistic missiles is observed by the satellite. So free countries, the coaches of this group, definitely they know who did it. The second time they did the same, they violated ceasefire two minutes after it was announced. And the third time uh, yesterday when they launched a uh, cluster bomb on the city of Terter, four people were killed. Uh, among them one seven-year-old girl, so it was them. There's no evidence that we did it. What we do is opposite. I said that we will not respond to them the same way. We will respond to them on the battlefield. We do not attack cities. We do not attack civilians. Only on the battlefield, but we have to defend ourselves. If they attack you, if they want to regain the positions which they lost, we cannot just uh, stay calm. We need to defend. And the more that we defend, the more territories we liberate. But exactly the same thing they claim as well. They say you use cluster bombs. Uh, I mean, there was even like some proofs, there were some proofs from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch that you use cluster bombs uh, there in Berg Karabakh. I mean, uh, wh why this? Why do you use this kind of arms? We don't use, we defend ourselves. We invited Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch to come to Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, their coverage of the events is only from Armenian side. They did not approach us to come here. Therefore, we have big doubts about the impartiality. But now they come, as far as I understand. Human Rights Watch, they are coming, or they told me. They are coming because we said, why don't you come here? After we made a request to them, please do come here, they agreed to come. But why didn't they come in the first place? They told me that they wanted to come. They asked for several times, but you didn't give them access. No, no, that's... No, that, it's not possible, because that was what we did 
just yesterday said, why they don't come? Let them come and go to Ganja, go to Tetter, meet the people whom Armenians attack. And again, the ballistic missile launch is seen from the satellite. No one can say that we launched a ballistic missile on any civilian compound in Nagorno-Karabakh or in Armenia. Let me ask again about this cluster munition, because of course you know it's a very serious subject. Um, uh, I had a look into the research of Human Rights Watch and the proof was uh, quite interesting. They had pictures and they even um, named the, the name of the weapon. They said it was an LAR-160 cluster bomb from Israel. Do you really want to dispute that fact? Yes, of course. There are no proofs about that. And I would like them to come here and to give these proofs. At the same time, to go to Genja, to go to Terter, to go to Barda, and see what kind of weapons Armenians are using. And be so in So if they find the weapons here, you rely on their research? No, we, we, they will have to, because there's no way for them to say no. Let them say, because so far, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International was very aggressive on Azerbaijan. They never made any comment about violation of human rights in Armenia. When a journalist died in Armenian prison, they were silent. When leader of main opposition party of Armenia was jailed, they were silent. When former presidents are on trial, they were silent. They don't want to see because they have so-called Armenian, uh, you know, origin people in their structures. And these uh, organizations are basically used in order to damage the image of Azerbaijan. But nevertheless, we invited them, let them come and say what they see. Actually, you never signed the UN Convention on Cluster mun Munition, so why is it a problem for you? Actually, you could use it. But did Armenia sign it? No, no. but we are talking about Azerbaijan <laughs> right now, not about Let's Armenia. Talk, we are talking about conflict. We are talking about conflict, and the fact that we sign or don't sign any kind of convention doesn't mean that we are using it or not. We have enough ammunition. We have uh, modern weapons, and we demonstrate it on the battlefield. And what we do, we liberate the territories not with bombs. We liberate the territories with our fighters, which take one village after another, one city after another, raise the Azerbaijani flag. So that's how it's done. Uh, coming to this subject, I mean, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be a goal somehow to, to um, take over those seven districts and afterwards to negotiate maybe and to come to an autonomous zone of Bergkarabakh? We suggested that, but Armenians always reject it. Uh, the co-chairs of the Minsk group can uh, prove what I say. We always suggested, we always were committed to the peace plan, so-called uh, basic principles, which uh, provided the liberation of the occupied territories of Azerbaijan in phases. At the first stage, five. At the second stage, two. But now among those five, almost uh, all of them have been already liberated. Therefore, Armenia always was against that. And frankly speaking, what we've seen on the battlefield after we liberated the territories, those, uh, you know, engineering constructions which we built, they invested maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, they show that they were not planning to leave those territories. Because if they planned to leave the territories, they wouldn't have invested so much. There are several lines of defense with the modern equipment, modern weapons, and modern engineering uh, technology. Therefore, all their uh, behavior on negotiation table was an attempt to mislead the uh, mediators and us. They were making the negotiation endless and wanted to win time, what they've managed to do for 27 years. Therefore, we are committed to the basic principles. The seven districts must be returned to us. Never Armenians lived in those districts. Plus, Azerbaijanis who were expelled from Nagorno-Karabakh, and there have been 40,000 people of Azerbaijani origin in Nagorno-Karabakh before war, must return there. And then that's how the plan should be implemented. An autonomous region without any Azerbaijani influence? Uh, that was part of the discussions, but we did not come to a final agreement about that. But you would agree about that? Well, we need to discuss it now, because now there are new realities on the ground. Always we heard one... Uh, what kind of influence do you want to have there in an autonomous region? I mean, no. is this contradicting by itself? No. First of all, we did not agree on any autonomous region. This is first. We did not come to this agreement. When we were suggesting that, Armenians were rejected. 
they were demanding independence, which we did not agree. Now, the realities on the ground have changed. We heard many times that there are realities, and you have to take them into account. And we said, okay, so we change the realities. Now they will have to take it into account. And what we suggested them during these 27 years, maybe not uh, valid any longer. Therefore, we need to have discussions now. And by the way, we are ready to send our foreign minister to Geneva tomorrow to start a new round of negotiations, if Armenia is ready, and to discuss the future of Nagorno-Karabakh at the negotiation table. But for that, Armenia should stop. They always wanted, during these months, to regain back the territories which were liberated, and that was the main reason for their defeat. When we were there uh, in this area among us, the question came up, why actually is Bergkarabakh so important for Azerbaijan? I mean, is, is there kind of resource, or is it just symbolic? Elzas and Lataringia, is it important for you? Hmm? Bavaria, is it important for you? Or uh, Rhein Westphalia? It's our land, our territory, internationally recognized. It's not a matter of resources. We have main resources here in Baku. It's a matter of justice, it's a matter of national pride, and it's a matter of international law. International law and uh, the whole international community recognizes Nagorno Karabakh as integral part of Azerbaijan. And we are restoring justice and we are implementing. UN Security Council resolutions, which were on paper for 27 years. Are you actually recognizing that the majority of the people in this region were Armenians, as most historians say worldwide? Uh, with respect to history, I can tell you that Armenians were uh, transported or brought to this region after the peace agreement between uh, Karabakh Khanet and Ibrahim Khalil Khan signed it, and Russian Empire. And the agreement was signed by Russian General Sisyanov in the beginning of 19th century. Aren't they living there since centuries? No, no, no. no. They've started to be uh, transported to Nagorno-Karabakh after Kurekche peace agreement, and then Gulistan peace agreement, Turkmenche peace agreement, uh, 1805, 1813, 1828. You can see in internet, there is no mentioning of Armenians in these agreements. Armenians then were brought by Tsarist Russia from Eastern Anatolia and from Persia in order to change the ethnic and religious composition of the region. So most of the uh, historians, experts on the Caucasus uh, region are wrong? Yes, of course, because look at the documents. Historians, which historians? They're different historians, and history sometimes is motivated by political preferences, but look at those documents there in internet, and you can see, if you find any mentioning of Armenian population, uh, you will say that I'm wrong. So that's how it was. But the other thing is, yes, they lived there for 200 years, and the word Karabakh is Azerbaijani word, it's not Armenian word. Do you know how they call so-called capital of Nagorno-Karabakh? Stepan Akert. You know in whose uh, honor it is called? Stepan Shaumian. Stepan Shoman was an Armenian Russian Bolshevik, head of the criminal gang here, which committed a genocide against Azerbaijanis in 1918. So, if it was an ancient Armenian territory, why it is named Karabakh? And why the capital city is named Stepanakert and not some ancient name? Because they lived there for 200 years. In 1978, Armenians who live there raised the monument 150 years of their arrival to Nagorno-Karabakh. This is history. But again, they lived for 200 years, and we want them to leave. And I said many times, we want Azerbaijanis to go back, and Armenians live there where they lived historically for 200 years, no matter. Nevertheless, these people experience your uh, military action as, how they say, uh, ethnic cleansing. No, no, not at all. We've been the subject of ethnic cleansing. When they occupied Nagorno-Karabakh and seven districts surrounding it, we had 750,000 Azerbaijanis ethnically cleansed from seven districts plus from Shusha, which was part of Nagorno-Karabakh. We've been subject of ethnic cleansing. We didn't do any ethnic cleansing against 
Armenians, and we're not planning to do it now, because I said that we have to live together. It will not be easy, but we'll have to learn. But civilians were killed there right now, in the last couple of weeks. Civilians were killed in Azerbaijan also. 69. There as well. Yes, because it's a war. But 69 civilians killed in the territories which are far away from uh, the conflict zone, in Ganja. More than 300 civilians uh, have been wounded by Armenians. It's a war. It happens, unfortunately. I used to live in Israel for five years. Yeah. Um, I know very well that the drones in Israel, they are very accurate. Mm -hmm. So how does it come? I mean, it wasn't done by a drone, as far as I understand. No. But how does it come that the church was hit in Bergkarabakh? That was, uh, uh, as I said already, that was probably a mistake of our artillery. Or the second option could be that Armenians did it themselves in order to Christians put the are shooting on their churches? But it was a minor damage. It was not destroyed. Have you seen the images of that? It's a minor damage. The church was not destroyed. It can be repaired within two weeks, maximum. Therefore, we have a doubt that that could be done by them themselves in order to put the blame on us. Look in Baku at Armenian church. We preserve it. We restore it. Could you imagine Muslims to... Uh, to destroy or to demolize a mosque by themselves to make something up like this? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it may happen. Why not? Armenian church here in Baku is preserved by us. We did not destroy it. We protect it. We keep thousands of Armenian books there. But they, in the uh, mosque in Zangilan, which was liberated, they keep pigs there. That's the difference. As far as I understand, on the 1st of October, a man in Azerbaijan was put in prison because he demanded peace. I mean, um, some human rights experts, um, defenders, they say uh, you might have started this war as well to unite the nation behind you and to somehow to distract from the problems in the country when it comes to democracy and human rights. That's absolutely wrong. Uh, assessment. First of all, I don't know about anyone who was arrested. If you can give me the name, if you have the name, you give me. Do you have the name? I don't have the name right now, but <laughs> I will find out. I will find out. When you find out, you tell me. So we can consider this question invalid because you don't have the name. And I don't have this information. With respect to distraction of attention, there is no need to distract the attention. Uh, our political system is efficient. Before uh, this clash, after and even before the parliament elections which we had, I launched a kind of a new uh, process of political cooperation. And we made a public appeal to all political parties to start practical cooperation, to put an end to hostility, and to start at least talking to each other. And except two parties, all the other parties, 50 of them, supported them. We started a modern, new political process. We have now many opposition uh, members in our parliament. Uh, the political process is very efficient. Aren't there many opposition members as well in prison? In no, no, no. Those who are in prison, they are in prison for uh, the uh, crimes they committed. There is no one here on political charges. And uh, opposition what is... What kind of crimes? Saying their opinion? No, no, no. Different crimes as any, any other crime. I don't know exactly which, but it's just ordinary crimes. So we don't have this uh, kind of a reason. Second, our economic performance during the pandemic is one of the best. Our economy declined only 3.9%. It's much lower than in some European countries. Poverty level in Azerbaijan is 5%, much lower. Unemployment level is 7%, much lower. We have uh, hot currency reserves which exceed our foreign debt six times. So I don't have internal problems. Why should I launch it? Would you call Azerbaijan an example for democracy? No, no, never. Would you call your country an example for democracy? Somehow, yes. Uh, but you ban opposition rallies. Hmm. No, yeah. actually not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That extremists who wanted to have a rally, I forgot the name. You banned them. I don't know about that. Uh, I mean, even during those corona times, uh, no, they, it was before they were corona doing times. demonstrations. We are not, and we do not pretend to be. But there are countries which pretend to be, 
but they kill protesters. Do you know how many people were killed during this uh, Yellow West protest? Do you know? More than 10. Killed. But we are not talking about France. No, no, let's, talk about, let's talk about Europe. Let's about talk about, Azerbaijan. no, let's talk about those who pretend to be democracy. We are not pretending. Yes, we have shortcomings. I will but, ask Mr. Macron but about But those who kill protesters, who kill protesters on the street, 10 of them killed. We look how in Europe you beat protesters, you beat them by horses, you bring dogs, and this is considered democracy. How important is the country where we came from right now, Turkey, for you, and um, especially during this uh, military operation, during this war? I mean, there are um, Turkish soldiers here. Yesterday, we spoke to some of them, and um, they told us they are from Turkey. You so, spoke to soldiers? Yeah, yeah. On so the battlefield? No, 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 but where? The battle city, in the city of Baku. <laughs> they are fighting here in Baku. No, no, they are here. <laughs> Nevertheless, they are here. I guess they are here. They can be German soldiers doing, here now. You're doing um, we military have, yeah, we, exercises together. Yeah, yeah, we do. We yeah. do. But yeah. if if a third country would get involved into this conflict, do you expect the help from Turkey? Uh, we do not expect any third country to be involved. Uh, we don't see which country can be involved because the countries which surround us are our partners and friends. We know that Armenians want to involve some of them into this battle, but I'm sure it will not happen. It's a battle uh, between us and Armenia, and, no, and everybody should stay away from that. Turkish soldiers can be here, yes. We have, uh, last year we had 10 joint military trainings, but also we have military trainings with other countries. We are part of the NATO uh, partnership for uh, peace program, nothing strange. You saw them in Baku, you didn't send them. Send them do, you the good? do you feel safer with F-16, Turkish F-16 here? In Turkish F-16 came here as a result of the military training, and they stayed here because the Armenians launched an attack on us, and they are here as a sign of solidarity. They are not participating in the, any battle, and they are not planned to be part of that. Three times ceasefires were broken. One negotiated by France, one negotiated by Russia, one negotiated by the USA. Which international power could stop this war? I think uh, Armenia should stop it. International power, uh, these uh, three countries which you mentioned, are co-chairs of the Minsk Group. They are leading countries of the world, members of UN Security Council, permanent members. These countries adopted for resolutions demanding withdrawal of Armenian troops, but these countries didn't do anything in order to implement these resolutions. These resolutions were on paper. That shows that this mediation was not efficient. But at the same time, uh, we cannot think about some other countries which can be more powerful. Therefore, the only way to stop war is for Armenia to stop, to admit its defeat, to admit our victory, and then to commit to liberation of the part of the territories. We will liberate them anyway. They did not believe when we started counterattack. We said, we will liberate. Stop it now. They could have stopped even when we took Fizuli back. They do, you, did. do you have the feeling that they, are, that they are not really interested in this conflict? Whom you mean? Those three countries, for example? Well, uh, no, I don't have this feeling, because if they were not interested, they wouldn't have been mediators. They have a mandate from OSCE. But the mediation wasn't successful. Yes, it wasn't successful because they did not uh, put sanctions on Armenia. I raised it many times. Armenia should have been sanctioned, like Iraq was sanctioned when Saddam Hussein occupied Kuwait immediately. And there were serious sanctions against Iraq. If the same happened to Armenia, then they would have moved the forces back. So they closed their eyes? Yeah, they closed their eyes. Yeah. They, I would say, not close their eyes, I, they always were saying there is no military solution. They wanted that mm, this situation continues more or less the same way. I think they were fine with the fact that the conflict seemed to be frozen. They thought that it may be frozen forever. Uh, and they only tried to think about some confidence building measures, some monitors, so that there is no outbreak. But they did not. Uh, implement their mandate in accordance with OSC decision, and they should have forced Armenia. I think each of these countries unilaterally can send such a message to Armenia that it 
should listen to it, but they didn't. Are you listening to them? I'm listening to every partner, uh, but it depends what I do after I listen, but I'm listening. Two days ago, I heard you in the radio asking the question, where has Armenia the money from to, to do this war? Yeah. What is the, the answer? No answer. I'm asking this question for one month. We uh, made a preliminary calculation. I guess somebody who's asking this question continuously somehow has an answer on mine. Well, if I had an answer, I wouldn't have asked. If I'm still asking, it means that I didn't get an answer. We made a preliminary calculation about the minimum. And by the way, I did not disclose all what we have destroyed. That will come. $2.7 billion cost of the ammunition which we destroyed and which we took as a trophy. Where the money comes from? Armenia is a poor country. Its budget is less than $2 billion. Its foreign debt is $8 billion. They are supported by Russia. And that was, that's your opinion, yeah? You well, say? This is official. This is no um, secret. Yeah. Somebody else? Maybe. I don't know. So I'm asking, but nobody is responding. So I will continue to ask. Your Excellency, Mr. President, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.